Higher education in the United States is a nearly $600 billion per year industry that some observers describe as unsustainable and on the verge of a fundamental crisis. Today's guest argues those stories are overblown and that colleges and universities can still serve the common good. He's Charles Dorn this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Storing the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Each week, we sit down with storytellers and scholars to explore the narrative shaping American public life. This week, we're joined by a scholar from Bowdoin College in Maine. Charles Dorn is professor of education and the author of For the Common Good, a new history of American higher education. Chuck, thank you for being with us. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. So let's start with the myths that surround American higher education today before we dive into the book itself. What are the big myths today? Sure. So um, there are lots of them, actually. Uh, one is that uh, colleges and universities are ivory towers, um, that they are set aside um, from society, that they remain apart from the sort of rough and tumble uh, of what goes on in America, and um, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, they are in many ways a part of American society. They're an expression of what's happening in American society, and we can see that historically during the different periods in which different kinds of institutions have been founded. Um, and then there, you know, there is a, a sense right now of a growing crisis in, in higher education that, um, that, that there are things happening on college and university campuses that we have never seen before that are unprecedented and uh, really that we don't have a sense of how to respond to those things and this could ultimately result in the demise of higher education as we know it, the sort of the end of college. And where do, where do these stories, where do these myths come from? Right, so a lot of it has to do with sort of um, public perception of what's happening on, on college and university campuses. But um, the thing that we have to keep in mind is that we use this term higher education all the time, but it's not exactly clear what we mean by it. Um, when we think about the different kinds of colleges and universities that exist in the United States today, there are private, there are uh, non-profit, there are women's colleges, there are military academies, research universities, community colleges, and the list goes on and on. So we use this term higher education a lot, and we talk about a crisis in higher education, but what are we really talking about? What kinds of institutions are we talking about? I'll give you just one good example. There is uh, a lot of conversation now around student debt, mm -hmm. that students have gone deeply into debt, that it's not really worth it, college may not be worth the cost. Oftentimes, when we talk about debt um, today, we are conflating the, the amount that students are taking out in loans to acquire a, a bachelor's degree, an undergraduate degree, in contrast with professional schools. And it may make sense for students to take much more, uh, to go into greater debt if you're going to get a medical degree or a law degree than if you're going to get an undergraduate degree. But those things become conflated. And so we hear a lot of conversations about undergraduate students assuming $100,000 worth of debt, which is, generally speaking, not true on average. You know, the, the average undergraduate uh, graduates from a four-year college or university today with about $25,000 worth of debt. And um, over the course of a lifetime, we know that that debt is actually a good investment. So it's that sort of thing that happens. So you just described the many different kinds of, of institutions of, of higher education in the country, uh, a, a long list. But in, in some conversations, as you were talking about and as you were talking about, you hear the term college and there's no fine detail, there's no real understanding that college is a term that encompasses many different things. And people, some people seem to stop there. You know, it's mm, like the right. college kid, right. the college debt, the college right. this, you know, the snowflakes. You, you, we hear all these stereotypes and, and why? I mean, wh where's that com coming from, number one? And I think we know the answer perhaps to this. Does social media feed into that? Mm. 
Right. No, it's a great question, uh, Wayne. I think, you know, um, in many ways when people are talking about college, they are reflecting back on their own experience if they are college graduates. And um, most Americans in the United States have graduated from public universities. Uh, and so they talk about college and that's the image that they have in their mind. But other folks, of course, went to different kinds of institutions and they have a different perception. And I think that actually results in a lot of talking past one another. Um, do we really understand the community college purpose in the United States today? Uh, if so, how do we understand it? And is it in part a reflection on our own college experience or have we actually done the work of figuring out what colleges and what community colleges are up to? Um, I think that has a lot to do with it. For sure, social media has played uh, a major role in this, particularly um, in, in recent years around student activism on campuses. Um, there have been a number of very good studies that have been done that have been looking at student protest and student activism. And what we're finding is that a lot of that activism is actually limited to a certain number of campuses, predominantly smaller institutions in terms of the size of the student body. But you wouldn't know that in terms of the, you know, the coverage and certainly in the social media how this is sort of being covered or reported on. Uh, there's a sense that this is happening everywhere on all college and university campuses and it's just not, it's just not the case. It seems emblematic of a larger issue we have in our society which is short attention span. We look at a headline, we don't dive any deeper, we don't care to, to look at opinions or read further that might challenge our own beliefs. I mean, do you think that's true? That Oh, for sure. I think, you know, sound bites and um, abstracts and uh, this sort of thing are, are contributing to part of the, you know, part of the issue here. Um, but I do think, you know, I do think this, this continuing sense of higher education as being something that is uh, set apart from society or, or not really deeply embedded in, in, in how we operate in America continues to play a role in, in Americans' perceptions. And I think it, it, it really sort of uh, helps to shift their understanding in a way that's not terribly helpful. I, so, I, I see a lot of, I cover higher education right, for the Providence right. Journal. So I, I see that in particular in writing about research mm. and all that comes out of colleges and universities in terms of research that, that eventually trickle down or get to ordinary people, whether it's healthcare advances, whether it's medicine, whether it's technological innovation or whatever. And I think, again, that's a story that isn't perhaps widely understood, that when you get up in the morning and some of the things you do and, and interactions that you have came from or have their roots in, in colleges and universities, the research part. And, and that's just research. We're not talking humanities or many other roles that a college does play. Right. No, I think that's true. You know. Um, uh, many college and university faculty members are scholars and they spend a lot of time engaged in research uh, across the disciplines, so certainly science and mathematics, uh, but in the humanities and in the social sciences. And uh, it can be difficult in some ways for faculty to um, share that knowledge, which is very much rooted in a kind of expertise of a particular field or subfield, to share that more broadly with the public. And of course, we wind up relying on journalists such as yourself to read the research and to help translate it and interpret it for the general public. Um, but for sure, that's the case. Colleges and universities have made remarkable contributions to American society over time in, in terms of the actual education that they've provided, but certainly in terms of research and, and development. And that is, in many cases, I think, overlooked by many people. So we want to spend some time talking about the book, but I do want to sort of maybe put to death some of the myths that you identified. Sure. So point blank, are colleges and universities in the United States in a period of great disruption right now? So I wouldn't call it great, great disruption. We have seen over time, over the past 200 years or so, different moments in history when there are changes occurring in society that are being reflected uh, by colleges and universities and the campus becomes a kind of um, hotspot 
for a lot of change that's occurring in American society. And I do think that we're probably in one of those moments. I don't think it's an unprecedented moment at all. I think it will result in some changes to the way that we sort of do higher education in America. Um, but these are, you know, higher education has historically been very uh, resilient in terms of the sort of institutional resilience of colleges and universities. And we don't think of them that way. We think of them as these ivory towers that are sort of inflexible and, and, and never changing, unmoving, if you will. And so, yeah, I would say that we're in a moment of, of transition and sort of um, what we might call a sort of unsettled moment. But I don't think one of sort of disaster and so apocalypse. The four-year right? residential college experience is not going to disappear with a, in, in a wave of massive open online courses. Definitely Oops. not. Definitely yeah. not. Although if you certainly read some of the more popular coverage, you would get the sense that the wrecking balls are heading yeah. for the campuses, right? It's just not going to happen. So is a bachelor's degree still worth the investment? I mean, we were talking about debt, and, and a bachelor's degree is not free for right. many people, certainly. There, right. there is some debt or there is some expenditure if you don't get a scholarship or qualify for Pell Grants or whatever. Right. Is it right. worth it? So we know, based on the data, that it's absolutely worth it. Um, uh, lifetime income and earnings, um, the investment that students make in an undergraduate degree is absolutely worth it over time. There's no doubt about that. Um, I think the, the problem that we're having in thinking about colleges and universities in this way today is that we think this is a new question, or is a college degree worth it? This is not a new question whatsoever. In fact, um, uh, there is an, <coughs> excuse me, an issue of the Saturday Evening Post from May 1900 in which the cover story is essentially a question, and the question is, does a college education pay? Uh, this is a question that was really hot at the time because Americans wow. were wondering whether or not these places were becoming bastions of the elite and the privileged and whether or not there was a real benefit to paying the increasing cost of receiving an undergraduate degree. And um, the Saturday Evening Post uh, responded to this question by having uh, former President Grover Cleveland say, oh yes, most definitely it's worth the cost. He was not a college graduate himself, but he understood that there were changes in America's political economy and labor market that really required the kind of education that colleges and universities were providing at the time. So it's not a new question. It's been with us for a very, very long time. And the answer continues to be today, most definitely, it's worth it. And, and, and there's another piece, though, of is it worth it? <clears throat> and that transcends your economic prospects. Mm. And that is the life of the mind, the development of the mind and in, in of intellectual capacity and thinking. I mean, it seems to me that colleges have always played that role and today do still play that role and it, it, even perhaps more important today. And we don't hear that talked about a whole lot. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, if, if you, if it's quite remarkable um, if you think about the general conversation or debate about higher education today, it is almost completely around colleges and universities utilitarian purposes. Right, the you get a better job. And that's it, the pre-professional, the occupational nature. Very little conversation about the kinds of education that are, that are being provided on uh, college and university campuses that help to educate the citizenry, that help to sort right. of support the democratic processes that we have in place. That conversation has really become very, very restricted. It would be helpful, I think, if we could sort of, you know, expand that conversation a bit more. But a lot um, of that, a lot of that, a lot of that constriction uh, occurred uh, because a number of really big foundations uh, became very focused on STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, at the exclusion of all else, because they said the the econ the, the internet economy is the wave of the future. <laughs> We don't need historians. We don't need uh, experts in classical literature. Right. We need engineers and, and, and hard science people. But society has other needs that industry doesn't have. That's and right. Have, yeah. Has the academy kept pace with that broader societal need? Well, that's a good point. I mean, you know, uh, we, have, we are now in an era in, in, in the book, uh, I describe uh, colleges and universities as being in an era of affluence, uh, sort of social ethos of affluence has sort of infused American society and certainly higher education and these institutions, certainly the public ones because of the decline in state appropriations, but the private ones, private not-for-profit ones as well, are really chasing dollars. Uh, 
In part, that's because an arms race has existed over the past couple decades in higher education. This is a relatively new thing uh, where you have a very, very competitive marketplace and colleges and universities are trying to sort of outcompete one another. Um, and one of the ways to do that is to have beautiful science centers and to be able to demonstrate the utilitarian purposes of the college or the university. Um, that's a real problem, right? Because we know that an educated citizenry is a well-educated citizenry. It's a well-rounded kind of education that we need to provide to students, not a very narrowly focused kind of education. Uh, and that, that is really shifting the kinds of ways that Americans are thinking about colleges and universities. So we need to take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. An audio version of this show can be heard three times every weekend on Sirius XM Satellite Radio's popular Politics of the United States channel. That's the POTUS channel, 124. Story in the Public Square is produced by a remarkable team in Rhode, at Rhode Island PBS in beautiful Providence, Rhode Island. I'm Jim Lutis, and I spend most of my days running the Pell Center at Salve Regina University in Newport. If you want to catch up with me on Twitter, I'm at J.M. Lutis. My co-host is an award-winning journalist with the Providence Journal and the author of 17 books so far, G. Wayne Miller. You can follow him on Twitter, at G. Wayne Miller. And our guest this week is a professor of education at Bowdoin College. Charles Dorn is also the author of a new book about the history of American higher education for the common good. So, uh, Chuck, let's talk a little bit about the book. You trace the history of 11 colleges and universities uh, and, and, and uh, note that in their own way, they all positioned themselves as champions and vehicles for the common good. So tell us a little bit about the book, but answer the question first, what is the common good? Right, so um, as a historian, of course, I'm interested in how people have defined the common good in, their, in the era in which they have lived and on their own terms. And so uh, what I don't do in the book is try to offer up a universal definition of the common good, but I really want to understand how it is that um, uh, faculty members, college and university leaders and founders, let's say over time, uh, have defined their institutional commitments to the common good. And it's, it's very interesting, in American higher education, if there is a theme that is woven throughout 200 years of higher education history, it is this commitment to the public good. And the, the terminology is quite similar across time. There are some slight differences, sometimes the references to the public welfare or the public good. But this really is the defining theme in American higher education. And so what I wanted to do in the book was to better understand how colleges and universities have defined this theme. Theme in, in different eras over time. So you don't have to name all of them, but the 11 colleges and universities, what, what kinds of colleges were they? Right. You sort of break that down for us. Community sure. college, I'm guessing, to Yeah, so to the, sub, others. the subtitle of the book is A New History of American Higher Education, and, and what is new about it actually is the method. Um, what I wanted to try to do was to understand the changes in American society by looking at them through the lens of the history of higher education. And that meant that I needed to identify colleges and universities that were established at different moments across a 200 year period. And I also wanted to understand the regional differences. Uh, in the first part of the book, I take a look at Bowdoin College in Maine, uh, Georgetown College, present day Georgetown University in the Mid-Atlantic, and South Carolina College, present day University of South Carolina down south, because there were significant regional differences. And what that meant for the book was that I needed to identify colleges and universities from across the United States, from throughout the United States, and then also different kinds of institutions. And so I look at all-male uh, denominational institutions, uh, community colleges, women's colleges, research universities, community colleges. Uh, I really try to capture a wide breadth of institutional types and kinds. Are, are, are schools still in 2017 motivated by this commitment to the common good? Absolutely, absolutely. It's not as much a part of the, the, the sort of popular conversation as I think it should be. Um, but if we think about the kinds of things that colleges and universities are, are doing today, the kind of research, let's say medical discoveries that are extending our lives or improving the quality of our life, um, if we think about the kind of teaching that's occurring that's really fostering critical thinking so that people can be critical consumers, if you will, of the media, 
Um, colleges and universities are doing this in, I think, very, very important ways today. I don't think that we've lost that. Um, but what I claim in the book is that over time there have been sort of de four defining themes across history. Uh, they are what we call civic mindedness, so a sort of focus on the common good, if you will. Mm -hmm. A practicality, a sort of shift um, to making a more practical kind of college or university. Uh, the example that I give is an agricultural college or a teacher training school, what were called normal schools uh, at the time. And then a shift to commercialism. Um, uh, a period during which uh, the United States became, as the historian Alan Trachtenberg described, incorporated, uh, and how colleges and universities responded to that. And then this more uh, recent development of affluence in American uh, higher education. And so one of the things that I try to do in the book is understand how those four themes, which have always been present in American society, this isn't a, uh, a, a sort of a shift that occurs from one to the next over time, but they've always been with us. In different periods in history, one of those sort of steps forward and provides the defining ethos or the defining moment of its era. And certainly in the early national period, it was civic mindedness, this commitment to the common good. Um, that has shifted over time. Today, I would say that it really is affluence that is the defining ethos in higher education. But civic mindedness is sort of hanging in there, right? And the commitment to the common good so remains. When you say affluence, mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Well, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's a period during which both students and institutions are basically seeking to become more affluent. And so uh, if we think about the surveys that are done of students, college students today, and we ask them what are their priorities in obtaining a, a college degree, uh, a significant number of them will say, well, I want to become wealthy. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to go to college so that I can become wealthy. The emphasis, the emphasis is not on I want to go to college so that I can learn to do something that I find really interesting and make a career out of it and earn an income based on that. It's more so, I want to become wealthy, what do I need to do in order to yeah. become wealthy? The institutions, <clears throat> however, have sort of you know, followed in the same footsteps, right, in terms of chasing dollars. Uh, and endowments. Right, right, yeah. The growth of endowments and really the competition that has come to exist uh, between the institutions. And also, of course, increases in tuition. You know, I mean, it's, this is a very recent phenomenon, but in 2003, uh, there were two colleges in the United States that charged more than $40,000 a year for tuition, room, and board. Nine years later, there were 200. Wow. Uh, now, the recession played a significant part in that, but what we have seen is really dramatic increases in, in tuitions over time, and a lot of it has to do with this sort of, you know, this competition and this movement towards a more affluent kind of, you know, space. So let's turn this over. Sure. Are there colleges, and we don't need to na name names, are there colleges that are neutral regarding the common good or antithetical, meaning they're not advancing, they're regressing? Right, right, yeah. Do those institutions exist either now or historically in, right. this, in this country? Right, so for sure, you know, colleges and universities, um, many of them have in their founding uh, grants or founding charters or legislation or certainly just in their sort of mission statements, they have a clearly articulated commitment or dedication to promoting the common good. Um, how they have done that over time is a different question, right? Um, many of them have done that over time, but many have at times acted in contradiction to that. Um, in terms of a class of colleges or universities that seem to not have at their core mission a commitment to the common good, um, we can say that the for-profit institutions, and really they're for-profit corporations more than they, than they are institutions, those in recent years have demonstrated kinds of behaviors that suggest really profitability is the goal here and not so much uh, advancing the common good. Sort of reminiscent of the predatory lending practices of the, of the housing industry. Oh, very much so, very yeah. much so, right. And we know that, you know, uh, certainly under the Obama administration, there were uh, um, increases in regulation and oversight of those kinds of places, and many of them then led to essentially being shut down. Um, those for-profit corporations, the, the higher education units of those for-profit cor cor uh, corporations, really um, lived off of public dollars. About 80% of their income came from public loans. 
uh, federally subsidized higher education uh, loans. And once regulations were put in place to limit that, many of them went out of business fairly quickly because they, they sort of lost access to those, those federal, federal dollars. We only have a couple of minutes left, but I, I know that your next, pr and we could frankly talk, there's, we've skimmed the surface of, of, of the yeah, book. Yeah, really. sure. that's sure. all we've done is skimmed. But, right. but you've right. got another project that you're working on now yes. uh, called yeah. Patriotic Education. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about that. This is an interesting project. It's a, a co-authored uh, volume with a colleague of mine at the University of Rochester, a philosopher by the name of Randy Curran. And um, this is a volume in a series of books that are looking at contemporary issues in education um, through a both philosophical and historical lens. And so they bring together, his, his, this volume brings together historians and philosophers to try to better understand these issues. Um, quite frankly, we started working on this project five years ago and rele the relevance of the project was not exactly clear. It has become very relevant uh, in recent years as we see, as we know from what's going on uh, in the NFL today, uh, how some expressions of patriotism are deemed acceptable, how others are not. Um, and how educational institutions have played a role in teaching students to be patriotic or not patriotic and in what ways. I, I, I come from a family of educators and I remember my dad explaining to me that one of the functions of schools in the United States is a socialization factor sure. and, and passing on sort of uh, civic traditions and civic engagement yes. is one of the functions of schools. Do we not do that anymore? Do we not do it well? Is it something that has fallen out of the uh, out of practice in an era of high stakes testing? Would uh, for sure, we continue to do it, and many of the teachers who I meet with um, are very much committed to doing it. Uh, high stakes testing and the testing regime has limited the capacity for that. Uh, there have been recent calls to reinvigorate civic education in uh, in the K through 12 arena specifically. Uh, you know, we often find ourselves in education sort of caring about what we can test rather than being able to test what we care about. Uh, and it's really hard to conduct a rigorous assessment of students' sort of civic understanding. Uh, it's much easier to know whether or not they can complete these math problems. And mm -hmm. so we put the emphasis on the completing the math problems and not so much on the civic engagement. Uh, schools are still fully engaged in this work, but it's harder to do given the space that they have to, to do it in the, in the present day. And, uh, and I, th I think, you know, as we all know from what's going on in America today, there's no more important work I think then educating students, especially at the K through 12 level, uh, to think critically about democracy uh, and the common good. Well, we're going to want you to come back when that book is done. We're out of time Great. for today, though. He's Charles Dorn. The book is For the Common Good. Uh, that is all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, please visit us at PellCenter.org. You can always follow us on Facebook and Twitter. He's G. Wayne Miller. I'm Jim Lutis, and we hope you'll join us again next week for more Story in the Public Square.